snack for organizing these little meetings. I think they're a fantastic idea. And thank you for inviting me to talk about medicines and some other treatments, because you know it's a big bee in my bonnet is medicines. Um, some general words. People that have seen me present before you know I love a swishy, swoopy presentation with lots of moving things, but that doesn't work on Zoom. And I've made some very, very dull presentation. Um, I do apologize for that. Uh, I would also like to say that my work laptop broke yesterday, so I've had to rewrite this presentation very quickly today, so I apologize for any spelling mistakes. And I'm using a Chromebook, which I'm not very good at. So first of all, I'm just first going to switch to- um, First of all, Drew, before you start, not everyone on the yeah. call will have met you, or not everybody oh. will know you. I know that the glass. So do you want to just say, um, first of all, just a little bit about where you work and your background and things like that, and how you've worked forever in Glasgow, yeah. but I'll let you tell, tell everyone that. So, yeah, I'm Drew. I'm one of the rheumatology nurses covering Glasgow and Clyde. I've worked in rheumatology, rheumatology only for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And for the 10 years before that, I worked in the ward of the kids' hospital in Glasgow that covered rheumatology inpatients. So I've kind of worked in rheumatology for about 20 years, but the last 10 has been rheumatology only. Um, I cover Glasgow and Clyde. So I run clinics out in Inverclyde Royal Hospital in Greenock. I run them in um, Vale of Leaving out in Alexandra. So we cover lots of Glasgow and Clyde and as you'll know Glasgow is one of the bigger centers for rheumatology so lots of people end up coming here for bits and bobs and going away because there's some tests that can only happen in the bigger center so a lot of people around Scotland who are in rheumatology have met me rather unfortunately. <laughs> um, I'm also part of the SPAR network for data uh, um, looking after the numbers we collect as part of the SPAR network. The SPAR network is our network looking after the managed clinical network of rheumatology in Scotland, and that's trying to give you guys as good a care local as you would have had at a big centre, and that's one of our things. Um, I'm also the representative on the drug committee for Scotland for what drugs we get to purchase. Um, so that's fighting about which versions of Humir and things to get so we can try and get nicer versions and make sure access is fair across Scotland. So that's me. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Um, Thank you. What I'm going to do is switch off my video just so the connection's a bit better and then I'll share my screen. So just give me two seconds to do that. So we'll stop the video. Hi everyone, welcome by the way. Sorry, I, I said that but I know some people have joined us so I'm just going to say welcome. It's lovely to see so many people here. So Thanks, can everyone... Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so Sparn, not Sparn, Snack asked me to have a chat about treatments for GIA. So I'm just going to run through all the things we kind of do to help look after um, you guys and your families. So um, one of the things I want to say is if I use the word short term and long term, rheumatology has this dreadful problem of saying the word short term when we mean about six months. Long term for us is two years. And for lots of families, and particularly young people, time is a very short thing. If you say to most teenagers, what have you got organised for next Easter? Most teenagers would say, that's months away. Whereas most people who are my age would say, oh, I've got this holiday planned. So time is a very different thing and for many people. So just be aware that if I use the word short term, I'm meaning a bit longer. I'm going to run through the physical therapies you can offer. So mental well-being therapies, medicines, how they work in the pathways and I'll chat about the drugs in groups, some of them individually. And I want to do a very minor update about the COVID-19 update because I watched your last video and there was a little bit of information that's changed that I want to just point out. Then we'll have some questions. So I've already done all that chat. Um, physical treatments. We've got physio, occupational therapy, podiatry and orthotics. So that first little bit of physio, you'll all know the word physio. Physio's main job and the thing that physio offer you guys is to assess movement and muscle weakness in a slightly different way from the doctors and nurses will do that in rheumatology. We know that if you've got a hot swollen joint, you won't move it. Either because it's sore or it just won't move. And we know that that muscle wastes quite quickly when you don't move. So we know that when we get you better, Lots of you end up with aches and pains, things not moving right, not because there's arthritis anymore, but because you've got some muscle weakness. 
and we get physio at this point to come and give you a plan to make that stronger to get that bit stretched we also know with lots of people with sore knees sore backs that it's not arthritis they may have had arthritis at some point but a lot of that is having very tight tendons and getting to move differently and actually stretch that tendon back out particularly lower back pain um, particularly oddly in teenage boys can all be about tight hamstrings particularly young chaps that play football we get lots and lots of footballers in with sore backs and it's all just very tight hamstrings we need to stretch those out as I, you would have noticed in the slide before I said I'm going to split this talk into things that we do as a hospital and a health service and things that you as a family and you as an individual as a young person can do. If we've sent you to physio, the key thing to do is try and follow that plan. Physio plans tend to be quite boring. We are more than happy for you to fiddle around with that plan and make it more interesting, but please keep with it. Muscle strength. For every week it's taking you to lose, lose that muscle strength, you're looking about two weeks to a month to build that strength back up. So if you've not moved a knee because it's been swollen for four weeks, we're talking about looking at two months, four months to get that back to full strength and working, working again. It's really fantastic, particularly oddly in lockdown, that lots of young people have actually done more exercise. They've been out walking more. They've not been sat at desks at school. So they've been out doing things. They've done PE with Joe on their laptops or on YouTube. And actually we've had lots more involvement with just being sporty. So lots of that physio style, style, style work you'll have done yourself if you're doing lots of exercise. Um, one of the big things we get is people who are sore not moving and not wanting to do PE, not wanting to do this. And we know from lots of experiences, the less you do, the sore you become. So if you are sore, please tell us, please let us try and see if we can get a way to do it. It might be a rough trip to get you a bit stronger, but once we get you stronger, lots of pains melt away as we get your joints moving properly. The problem with a, a weak muscle is that they tend to just, they don't weaken. All your muscles work by one to move your joint out and one to move your joint back in. And they tend not to get weak at the same rate. So one muscle remains stronger, so it ends up pulling your joint at a slightly funny angle and that can be quite uncomfortable. So we know that getting you strong will really reduce those sort of symptoms of pain that aren't arthritis. But lots of young people get after having a sort of flare of arthritis. The next batch of therapy is this occupational therapy. Occupational therapy, from a health service point of view, looks at the function mainly of your hands and wrists. And it's all about fine movements. Can you write? Can you do your buttons? Can you comb your hair? Can you do your teeth? Their typical work is lots of assessment, assessing hand strength, giving you strengthening plans, giving you adapted tools, whether that's fat or pencils, special shaped pencils, to make that an easier process and to get you stronger in your hands again. The things that you can do for us when it comes to occupational therapy, if you need occupational therapy, is one, come and tell us you're having problems. We've got many Young people come to us after six months, a year, saying, I've been struggling at school and I've been struggling for months and they didn't say last time. So please come forward and say this is being awkward. Um, the other thing, just like physio, these plans take a while to work and you really have to stick at them. So if we do give you a, an exercise plan for occupational health, please stick with it. It'll be a, a, a bit of work, but once you're through it, it actually will improve things quite a lot. Our next little bit of sort of physical therapy is a podiatry orthotics. I've put podiatry and orthotics together. That's a bit like someone getting Rangers and Celtic confused because they both play football in Glasgow. Please don't say out that out loud to a podiatry or orthotic. I said all the same thing because they're not, but they're working a very similar way. They're a bit like our occupational therapists in that they assess a very specific part of your body but they access your feet and what we call gait and that's how you move when you're walking um they may do some exercises they may give you alternative footwear they may suggest different footwear or they may provide what we call orthotics or shoe inserts um those can be off the shelf or they can be made to measure and made to measure will be put your foot into a plaster cast for five minutes and peel it off The things that you can do for that is hear us. We do have what we tend to find 
as young kids have had arthritis in their feet because their feet get a bit uncomfortable, move away from shoes that are a bit more supportive and really love to wear Vans or um, Converse trainers. And both those two are really dreadful for foot position and make your, what we call your gait or walk and make pains elsewhere. They're very comfy to wear, but actually walking and using them, they don't support your foot very well. So please don't buy Vans or, or Converse, they're a nightmare. Um, if you do want those, we can give you shoe inserts. Um, if we do give you shoe inserts, the big, big, big thing you can do is please wear them in slowly. Don't try and wear them all day the first day you get them. Wear them for 20 minutes. Spend a good month getting them, your feet used to them. They're designed to push your foot in a certain direction to make them more comfortable. I broke my ankle about oh, 11 years ago and I wear them and it must have taken me about six months to get used to them and I now can't be without them. Um, as I said there, it's like running a marathon, we can all do it, it just can't do it tomorrow, it just takes a little while. So moving away from our sort of physical therapies, I wanted to just briefly mention mental health well-being. Um, the hospital has five sort of principal sources that can help you with this. We're currently in this big period of COVID having destroyed many people's, and particularly our young people's, sense of normal, their sense of knowing they've done good or bad, because we've removed how they assess what is good and what is bad. So as of yesterday, exams disappeared. And so I would have known I've done good at school, I had a good exam result, but exams have just disappeared. We've also removed their, their normal school environments gone. And being in a normal moment is how you know you're doing good or bad that day. So we've got lots of young people, particularly the last nine months, really struggling with, not with arthritis or GI in particular, but just life. And all of us, all of us are carrying around a basket. And in that basket, you've got tasks to do to do your shopping, do your work. You've got a basket of the worries you've got about well, my, I happen to be moving house in a week. Will that house move out? Go fine. You've got your health concerns in there. You've got the worries about what your people around you think of you. And we all carry that basket. And when we know we're doing well, that basket's quite light. But when we take things out of that or add things in, our ability to cope with that basket and carry that basket of things gets harder. And we've got lots of young people just having trouble carrying that basket. And sometimes it comes out as a I'm not happy I've got GIA, I don't think I'm normal, I'm, I'm not like my friends. Sometimes it comes out as I'm not coping at school, but that kind of whole basket of worries is difficult. So the, the things we've got on offer within the hospital and the healthcare service is talking to your team. If it's about, you know, if it's about medicines, it's about GIA, talk to us, we're always here to help. We've got play specialists. Play specialists can make procedures and moments of stress much easier. They're not there for long-term things, but they are there for that moments of, I don't wanna get my bloods done. I don't want to chat to that person. We've had lots of success with our place specialists actually coming to help us with our young people, chat to us as people, because some of our, not our teenagers, but more of our kind of eight, nine year olds find all healthcare staff just threatening and even just being able to chat to us is a massive step for those and it makes it a lot easier. After that, we've got something called art therapy, um, which is currently funded by the Teapot Trust. It's about six years ago, I would have said, hmm, I'm not sure if that sounds like it's going to work. And I've been blown away with how well art therapy can help our young people understand the moment in life they're in. It's not psychology, it's not counselling, it's amazing. It, allowing people to discover where they are in life and what that life means at that moment and how to make it better. Um, it's an offer in many locations in Scotland and it's also available virtually as well now. Um, we've got psychology. Psychology and I've got CAM there, which is our psychiatry service. Psychology and psychiatry are very similar departments, but do very different things. 
In psychology are very much about sorting out a problem you're having at the moment about a particular thing and they'll do a piece of work with you to through talking therapies to to make you understand and help and figure out how you can cope with that situation better when we move on to cams that becomes very much more about a wider look at how life is in general and how we can make different parts of life different and help that they intermingle and intertwine in two services though and again i'm going to go through what can you do as family and as young people is one thing is to think and know if you're coping with life and if you aren't find help early there's an excellent website called youngminds.org.uk which has got loads of resources and advice and we have something and a chat service about young people's mental health we've also got another service that if you contact your local team they can put you in touch with who do a text-based service very similar but it's much more interactive um i've put in here use gap and halt concepts and find fun gap and halt are two lovely ways of thinking about life um it's particularly good for how are young people thinking how young people like to be dealt with gap is about being grateful appreciative and practical practice mindfulness and halt is about not doing anything at certain moments in time and being grateful and appreciative is remembering that even if some one thing is very bad at this moment that actually other parts of life are very good in terms of i have a roof over my head i have a bed i have been fed i've been to school i have clothes we the human psyche is very good at forgetting what is good in life and only focusing on that bad moment but imagine to take that step back to think about what actually is good today and think about those good things and appreciate those good things and yes there might be absolute dreadfulness going on my partner my boyfriend girlfriend's just left me i've just lost my school tea money i've lost an exam it's a very bad moment i think but there's lots of good stuff around that that actually is very helpful we know from lots and lots of studies if you spend five minutes nights thinking about all the positive things that have happened in your day oh hey there we are hello um we know that from lots of studies that if you spend five minutes thinking about the positive things you've had in that day where that's i've just had lunch i've managed to get a shower before you fall asleep your next day when you wake up you'll be much more positive and doing that repeatedly makes it better for longer the halt concept is just not doing anything you're hungry angry tired or lonely and i'm going to come back to how you work on that a little bit later the other thing is try and find fun and what i mean by fun is just light moments in life all of us in our life will experience dark moments and whether that's your partner's left you have you made bankrupt whatever that dark moment is the thing that gets through that is finding fun particularly during covid finding fun has been very hard for almost everyone because there's no fun to have the shops aren't open you can't go to a, your sport club you can't go to after school clubs um but finding good bright moments in life is really important and really look for them so if you don't look for them you won't find them and for mums and dads out there remembering during your teenage years how rough being a teenager was and how much you didn't feel heard and how much you didn't feel in control of your life and for the health service and for you guys is give your young person and for your people to talk up but give yourself a chance to be heard and chance to be in control and we would love to give you more control so please tell us if you don't feel heard so my five-step plan and there's a big lot of research in this and it's a very easy five-step plan is everyone whether that's your parent or a young person is having 10 minutes every day we speak to someone outside of school or the home record what you're eating seven minutes of mindfulness and you can use Co cosmic kids yoga on youtube or there's lots of other minds people just meditate or even just some quiet time get regular sleep is very important and there's a website at sleep scotland who've got excellent resources about how to get regular sleep and 
exercise at least 15 minutes a day. And there's been lots and lots of research showing those, those five steps, no matter what was going on in life, make things tremendously better. Um, number four, there's come and talk to us or put your hand up and say things are going wrong and we can try and see what we can do to help. Um, and the other thing to remember when you're having any conversation with anyone, whether that's talking to us, talking to your kids, or the kids talking to parents, talking to their friends, is always remember about missing information. And what I've wrote there is created truth. And it's people interpret that as, as do you mean a lie? And I really do not mean a lie. It's very easy to get to a point in life where you think you've sorted something or you know something firmly and for actually to all be what we call created truth. I did it to myself. I believed wholeheartedly. I have a, a boat. I co-own it with a few other guys. I got to the point about five years ago, I was convinced I couldn't sail anymore. Can't do it. It's too stressful. I'm not doing it. Can't do it. I was telling people that I would to sell my share of the boat. I couldn't do it. And after a couple of random conversations, I suddenly realized, and I mean suddenly, and it was a complete shock that actually the problem was that one of the people I go on the boat with, I was having a lot of trouble with. And once I realized that, everything was fine. Out in the boat by myself, sailing, no hassle whatsoever, doesn't bother me anymore. And I just have engineered it so that we're not clashing anymore. But I'd spent 18 months telling people it was stress in the boat and it wasn't stress in the boat. I had just made up something nice for myself so it would be easier to deal with as opposed to dealing with the problem. And we all do that to ourselves without realizing it and people around us have done it to themselves as well. So always be very careful with chats with yourself and with people that you've reconsidered what's going on all the time. So the main thing we do for GIA is medicines. Um, I'm going to very quickly scan through the immune system because we need to just like have some keywords from the immune system before we talk about the drugs. So I'm going to quickly whiz over. My primary three description I tend to use in clinic with families when I first meet them is that your immune system fights bugs. If you think of fighting bugs like soldiers, if you walk past a soldier outside in the street, they will not shoot you because they've not been told to. You've also got Marines. And again, if you walk by them in the street, they don't shoot you. And your body has all these soldiers and Marines sitting, waiting to work. At the same time, you've got spies and generals. The spies are going, is that me? Is it me? Is it me? It's not me. Attack that, please. And if your soldiers can't cope, they're going overwhelmed, they send in the special forces of the Marines and your generals do that. That's the basic part of it. There's about 12 jobs. There's 21 cells and multiple structures on top of that. There's two humeral, humeral protein forces. There's multiple cell structures, chemical forces. And there's multiple inter interconnections. I tend to describe this a bit like the cells being buses or trains, the forces being a bit like boats, the jobs being tasks of how you get around places, the structures all overlie each other. So it's a bit like trying to understand a map of Glasgow, only looking at the ScotRail map, the train network and the bus network, but not have any street names. So we're going to try and give some street names to this just so you understand why we're going to attack those streets when we get to the drugs. So the main cells of the immune system is the neutrophils and they're the first things that come in. They die very quickly when they're fighting. You'll know what dead neutrophils look like. Because when you're a teenager, you had acne and you had all those whiteheads and the pus in them was dead neutrophils. If your neutrophils are coping with that first fight, they don't do anything else. They just cope and they get on with it. If they need some extra help, they start sending messages out via things called the mast cells and they pull in more macrophages. Macrophages are just large cells that eat more things and don't die when they're eating things. And NKs are natural killer cells and they just kill things in a different way. If those aren't coping, they'll call in something else. We'll come back to that in a second. But that rough process of neutrophils and macrophages to natural killer cells is roughly what we call inflammation. It's the warmth 
it's the redness, it's the swelling, it's the sensation change you get with swollen joints and GIA. Um, the key pathway at the bottom of this is arachidonic acid and prostaglandins. I'm only going to come back to those words again. And the message pathways they have that routes in between different stations are the IL-6, IL-1, and, and TNF, oh, sorry, TNF, 19F. IL-1 gets sent as a message off from your body, away up to your brain, ask your thalamus to increase your body temperature, and that's where you get the fever from. IL-6 goes down to your liver, and it asks your liver to start producing what we call acute phase reactants and opsidins, which you don't need to worry about. But the thing you'll hear about we sometimes talk about in clinic is CRP, which is one of your opsidins, and it's a thing your body uses to help attack bugs. TNF is a gang leader. It can nudge IL-6, it can nudge IL-1, it can do the same job as IL-1, IL-6. But it's the, that first innate system kicking into gear. And if they aren't coping, they go, hello, via another thing called their dendritic cell. And it scoops up bits of those invaders, or what your body thinks is invaders, and it takes up your lymphatic system to your B and T cell stores in your lymph nodes to start making very specific weapons um, to attack what it thinks is the thing to attack. Measured pathways cross over. There's um, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF in, in that system as well. But IL-17 features hell in there, and so does interfering gamma feature heavily in there. So GI occurs when that initial process, recognizing what is something to attack goes wrong, and your body escalates an infl inflammatory response because it thinks it's got an invader, which actually is your knee or your eye. Um, so all the medicines we've got try and touch one of those systems. Steroids, I've talked about them just briefly on their own. If you remember that word arachnidonic acid, which is one of the very starting points of your inflammation system, steroids block that completely. They come in lots of different presentations. They are powerful, powerful drugs. They work so deep down in your immune system. Pardon me, I'm going to burp, sorry. Um, they work really well, but they're a bit of a napalm of a drug. They affect so many systems because they're so deep down. We don't like using them long term. We like using them very local in as little a dose as possible, but sometimes we can't do that. If you think about eye drops, you use steroids and eye drops, your PRED40. Um, that's very good for inflammation at the front of the eye, but not deeper down because it just doesn't penetrate deep enough and we tend to have to use sort of more systemic medicines by tablet or by infusion. Really love to use it as injections straight into joints like knees and hips and fingers. And for lots of our little young people are under six year old, if we catch you early enough and inject, let's say it's a knee early enough in that process, sometimes your innate immune system has not called in the, the marines and actually that just stops your arthritis completely. And actually it's done. And for about 40% of our wee young tots that get a knee injection early in their treatment, that's all they ever need from us. So catching it early is fantastic. It's why we're so very pushy with our other medicines about being very quick, because we know the quicker we can get in, the better chance we have of this not becoming a long-term problem. Um, we don't like tread long-term, makes you put on weight, makes you hypertensive, it can weaken your bones but they are a fantastic choice for short-term quick fixes. The next slide I've put down is this traditional, what we call DMARS, which is Disease Modifying anti rheumatic Drugs. Very catchy name. Um, these are old drugs. They all tend to sort of go after the cells of the immune system more than anything else. You'll know the name, methotrexate. I think I'm probably going to go to my grave with methotrexate written on my tombstone. I think I say it so often. It's when I first started my job as a specific rheumatology nurse over 10 years ago, I was discharging lots of young people in wheelchairs. Lots of my job was chatting to families about working in telephone banking because we hadn't really fixed things or they'd had lots of damage. I was discharging kids with essentially blindness. Methotrexate is one of those drugs that transformed the care that we give our young people. It's not the nicest medicine for some, for some young people, but in terms of treatment for arthritis, that drug moved us from having patients in, in wards, having treatment, and us not having much treatment to offer, 
to us having outpatient-led clinics. And most of my chats nowadays are essentially, we take a drug, please. Do you want to have another drug? Oh, I've got a drug. Do you want to have another drug? Drug. Um, as opposed to worrying about joint damage and sort of long-term health impacts of arthritis, my job really is now drug management. Methotrexate, wonder, wonderful drug for, meth for arthritis, can have some rough side effects. It can be disliked a lot. Um, it, I'm going to be slightly leaning towards sexier, but I tend to have some girls who feel nauseous with it. I tend to be a bit younger. And I tend to have teenage boys who essentially want to sleep the day after it. So it can make you lethargic. It can make you nauseous. That nausea can be mild, in which case we'll ask you to keep going. And it can be quite day destroying, in which case we'll try and offer you something different. Well, thronamide um, was a drug that came along just as the drugs I'm going to speak about in the next slide came along. It's a lovely option, has less side effects than methotrexate, has some very significant issues to do with con uh, getting pregnant, just like methotrexate does. It's not a drug you should go on um, if you're planning to be pregnant. But it's a bit of a duller drug than methotrexate in terms of side effects, in terms of those you experience. It's a little bit more fiddly when it comes to blood monitoring. Um, self cells is another drug we can use to treat arthritis. It's a drug that 10, 20 years was one of our mainstays. It's one of the few drugs we had. It's now a drug we use in very few arthritis situations, but when we do use it, it's a very good drug. So 20 years ago, we'd have used it with all GIA, whereas now we're only really using it with our um, anesthetic related arthritis patients, because it can be very good for those sort of teenage boy group that have those sort of sore tendons. Other medicines are in the DMARD pa packet, but are more to do with supporting the other drugs or methylate and azathioprine. They work in very similar ways to our methotrexate sulfazalzines. Mycophenolate will not help arthritis needle or azathioprine. Mycophenolate will help um, uveitis if it's just uveitis you have. On to our biologics, and it's one of the things I want to just quickly whiz through the immune system is anti TNF, and you'll have heard that word TNF is a, is a key signaler to get your immune system kicked into gear. So we have these medicines called anti TNFs. They were designed 20, 25 years ago um, by exposing mouse cells for the earlier ones, now human cells, to things we wanted to get rid of in the body. So we exposed those things to TNF, and then in a lab, we've grown them lots and lots and lots and got lots of antibodies out of those. These are all proteins. All these new drugs are bio, all these new biologic drugs are all proteins. They're all big, massive molecules. They all have to be injected or infused. None of them can be oral or tablet or any of those things, which steroid and other DMARDs can be. And anti TNFs are our gang leader. Um, so we like to go to those first of methotrexate. Rolfromid hasn't worked. Um, I've put down the drug names there. Quite a few of these drugs are moving out of patent. So there's lots of different brands in the market just now. Um, you'll know drugs, some of you'll know things like Humira and Embrol. They've now been replaced, or in addition to have the things such as Amjavita and Benpali or uh, Aralzi. Um, all the antinefs, the first four antinefs there, all work in roughly the same way. They're monoclonal antibodies. They pick the TNF out of your system. A tanocept is an anti-TNF, but it blocks where that little molecule goes and turns the key to switch your immune system on. So it works in a slightly different way. The first four can be used for GIA, poly, oligo, but in all the other types other than systemic and not anything with uh, uveitis. Sorry, those four can be used uveitis. A tanocept is does not work in uveitis, so we don't use that. Then in that sort of going through just through biologics in order, we've got IL-1 blockades. And you've heard that IL-1 is a marker of getting your inflammation system going. And as those drugs came to us, it made us realize that systemic arthritis doesn't sit in the same pile as the other types of GIA. 
Um, the other so systemic arthritis doesn't really respond to IL-CNX, whereas it does respond to IL-1 and IL-6. So arthritis responds to IL-6, so your, your poly, your oligos, your incident related all work with IL-6. IL-1 has not shown to work for the other types of arthritis. It does work very well in systemic. Those two drugs, are anakin and canabicab, are very similar other than one is daily and a slightly zingy injection and is within the price category of almost all the other biologics. Canakinumab is out with the price category of other biologics by substantial margin. The prednisolone and the other DMARs we spoke about are particularly cheap drugs because they come in tablets. We're talking a couple of pounds a month, apart from injection methotrexate, which we're talking about five, seven hundred pounds a year. The, all the biologics are sitting in this sort of thousand to about ten thousand bracket other than kind of came up which sits in the much 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 higher than that we then got il6 chocolate sort of lamp we're kind of spoken about those generally the only real issue and difference from that from the other ones is that it can be a little bit problematic with infections particularly toenails and we'll give you lots of talk about hygiene for feet about those and we like to be a bit more self-inspecting your body to make sure you've not got a spot that's going mad. Um, IL-17 is a very new one, still not licensed for young people, but we're using it in lots of young people in Scotland. Very good drug for psoriatic arthritis, so your psoriatic GIA, um, transformational, and it's a drug that we've picked up very quickly because if we had a gap in care because psoriatic patients weren't as well looked after, or we didn't have a drug that quite worked as well, in fact, I was really filling that gap. The last two biologics just to touch on, I mentioned B and T cells. We've got one that touches T cells called a Batacept. It's another good drug, it takes quite a while to work, but it's another good drug. Works very well with our general types of arthritis. And we've got one called Rituximab. It's a, quite an old drug. It's one of our older um, biologics. When I first came into this job specifically, we used Rituximab quite a lot. Whereas now we use it in very particular types of arthritis. We only tend to use it in our polyarthritis young people who have got rheumatoid fat in their blood or CCP in their blood. That makes up, internationally they should make up 5% of our caseload. Within Glasgow and Clyde, it makes up less than 1% of our caseload. So it's not a drug we use often, but it's a very good drug if it's for the right case. And what you'll tell from this chit chat is that although we've given you a diagnosis. As our new drugs have came along, it's made us understand our drugs better and better and our conditions better and better. And we've picked out where to go first and where to go second in some conditions. So our young chaps or young girls with ERAs or endocyte related arthritis, we tend not to use methotrexate at the start anymore because it doesn't tend to work. We tend to go to one of our anti-TNFs straight away. Um, and we move through that as we need to. Although methotrexate will always come up, I'm going to be saying, as I said, on well, my two consumers, going to say the word methotrexate. Um, moving on to the last slide about medicines, there's some new medicines possibly coming to some subsets of GA, which lots of people are going to be very excited about. They're not here yet. They were first discussed in 1995, the research into this family started, got signed off into adult care about two or three years ago. And they're called JAK inhibitors. There's a few names just up there. They're small molecules. They work on um, interferon pathway, blocking that. So they work in a very particular way. Within the adult sector, they've used it in lots of subtypes of adult arthritis and discovered that it works in a very particular group. There's studies ongoing and happening for the past two or three years trying to see if it they'll work in young people as well. And we're waiting to see how these come along. We don't think they're going to be like Sekikinumab, which is going to be this drug we rushed for because we thought we've got a gap here. We think there's going to be another choice to offer you. I imagine lots of young families will want to pick something that's an oral tablet, um, but we don't quite have makes. We don't know where to give them. We don't, as all our medicines take quite a long time to work, we don't want to be spending six months offering a medicine that then doesn't work. 
so we're not quite there to use them yet but we're fingers crossed hoping to have some more data coming forward so that's my chat about medicines and i'm going to open up to questions in a few moments but i just want to have a very brief thing about covid19 vaccine just so you've all heard it as of this week the jaic which is the joint council on vaccination for all the uk their plan for COVID-19 vaccine is not to give it under 18s, so it's only 18 and over. There's been a request lodged by the Scottish Government and some other people to open that up to 16 and 17 years of certain medical diagnoses. GI may or may not make it onto that list, we don't know that yet. The other big thing to say is COVID-19, the message that was handed out last week or the week before the month for is slightly different from what it is now. So this plan may change as we get more vaccine coming into the market. The vaccine we have just now, because the government's bought 360 odd million doses and we only actually need about 120 for this year. As those vaccines come through and get put through trials, who we're going to offer is going to change as we move forward. So that was a very quick chat through medicines. I'd love to hear some questions. I'm more than happy to take any questions about particular drugs or particular reasons why we're doing it. I know I've whizzed through very quickly, but that was a 10 spend more than 20 minutes on one medicine that I've already taken a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I put my video back on if I can find the right button. There we go, and let's find a video. So hello everyone, I'm back. Thank Sorry, you. that was such a lot of information in 20, 20 minutes, and I think I've taken about 40. I do apologize. Well, Drew, I thought it was absolutely brilliant, and I particularly found the um, talk about mental well-being particularly relevant and useful for me. That that bit at the moment is so critical for the kids. I know we've got Christmas to look forward to, but there's a lot going on. As you said, there's not much fun at the moment. It and and it, it's people can cope with one thing at a time, and I think particularly some of our new diagnoses, I find it really challenging with the whole COVID lockdown, no school, no friends, no after school, no scouts, no thing. And then they've got this other thing that makes them different has been quite a challenge for some of our young kids and families. It's, it's a, a, there's not much I can do to help because I can't, I can't open up society, but it, it, I feel really bad because this, the normal part of life is how you know things are going fine. And we've, all that's been kind of mm -hmm. pushed away by the COVID changes. So. Yeah, I mean, we find it really difficult, even with snack, not being able to have any face-to-face -face events or fun things for the kids. We normally have a Christmas party in December and even just not being able to plan anything or just, just have any events at the moment. But hopefully, you know, 2021 is looking more positive than, than we hope for already with that vaccine being rolled out <laughs> so far. Um, if anybody's got any questions, please, now is a really good time. You've got Drew by himself. It's much less busy than a clinic. So it's a good time to just, if, if, there, wasn't, if there was anything that wasn't clear or anything for yourselves that you want to discuss, Drew is here and he's got lots of experience and knowledge to share. If you're not comfortable asking, just type the question and then um, Kristen can, can read them out for us. Um, so just go ahead if, if you have anything, anyone. Hi, Drew. Um, can I ask how long you would normally give methotrexate to work on its own before you decide, you know, that's not going to work or it is going to work? So, that's a, it's a very interesting question. If you wind back 10, 20 years, the only people we gave methotrexate to were those that had really, really aggressive, angry arthritis. And we'd say at that point, oh, it'll be working in about eight weeks. We'll find out it's working in eight weeks. The more we've used it, the more we've really understood, and we've done quite a few surveys of people, and we found out that the more, if you ask patients as opposed to our hand examination of, of patients, when is the moment that you felt metastasis worked, worked and got working? It's six months. So we would probably say to you, roughly, if things aren't moving by three months, we've probably failed metastasis. But if things are starting to get better by three months, give it six but if things are still a mess by three months message exit isn't for you we need to move on so there's a, a kind of there's a where have we got to so far question in the middle of that okay thanks yeah helen did you have your hand up sorry 
Yes, please. Drew, Hannah's been moved on to back onto methotrexate. Um, the doctor suggested her try and live, is it Gilamvo? Uh-huh. Version of it. But we couldn't get it. So she's just on a generic one, which so far so good, it's going fine. I'm just wondering, does the Gilamvo have less side effects or is it not? Is it just a better tasting one or? What's... Is it the Rosemont one you're on? I don't know what one she's on actually, but I just know okay. we couldn't get the Gilamvo. But Gilamvo. so far she's... Uh, yeah, okay. so Gilamvo and there's a brand called Rosemont, which is kind of the generic one, but it mean that pharmacies can source a different version as well. Um, both of them, the, the version we had 10 years ago was absolutely foul tasting. So foul that I tried it once and vowed never to even offer it to a patient. Both Gelambo and the Rosemont one taste fine. Um, they've no good different, the, the side effects aren't different. The only real difference between Gelambo and Rosemont, which I think is probably what you're on, is, um, is how long it lasts in your cupboard and how much you're using. Um, Cost-wise, there's not much difference. It, it's more, Gelambo is the one that has a license, um, but it has a slightly shorter self life. So it's maybe they've just not managed to get it. It's um, it, no, the side effects are just the same. Okay, I think just because Hannah's had issues in the past, they wanted it to go as smoothly as possible. Yeah. But she's taste. It's a medicine, and she's taste taking it fine, and yeah. she says it tastes okay. So so far so good. I just wondered if there was another reason to pursue getting the right the dry lambo. No, no. no. Um, if it's palatable and going down, I would stick with what you've got. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. Hi Drew, can I ask a quick question if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely fine. Hi, um, John, he was on, he's still on the Tanocept, which Touchwood seems to be working okay. It was on the one that the nurses made herself, they had to do all the syringe, but he's now uh -huh. moved to the pen form. Mm -hmm. But he thinks there's a big difference in pain wise. He seems to think this one's a lot more stingy, as he would describe it. Um, uh, I'm, we're definitely not going back the way because we do the injections now, which is fine, but do you, have you found that with some other kids? So um, there is a big difference between the powdery one you have to make up mm -hmm. and a pen or syringe version. So a tannercept is one of the biologics. It's a big protein. And if you think about proteins you've got in the house, you've got milk, you've got eggs, you've got cheese, you've got bacon, all those kind of things. If you leave those out when they're wet, they go off. Mm. And so to keep them, so when it's a powder in that vial, because it's dried, if you think about if you have dried milk or dried eggs, I'm, I lived in the country when I was younger, so we only had dried milk. So dried milk lasts for ages. It just doesn't go off because it's dry. It can't go off. So the powder one doesn't have any preservative in it. The liquid ones, which are pre-made, either in a pen or a syringe, those have got preservatives in it. Preservatives tend to be citric acid. Citric acid is the thing you get in lemon juice. Mm -hmm. and if you imagine cutting your finger and getting lemon juice in it, it has a zing to it. So yeah. there, there will be a difference in sensation. Um, you can make that better by, are you taking it out of the fridge a good while before, or are you taking yeah. it out of the fridge mm -hmm. Yeah, you normally take it out quite early on in the afternoon and we do the injection maybe about six o'clock. Okay. Some people, so if you think about having an ice cream headache, that sort of coldness you do, if you take it out of the fridge and do it straight into your skin, you can get a sort of ice cream sensation in your skin, that kind of headachey thing, but in your nerves. But if you do it cold, the citric acid doesn't zing as much. So sometimes doing it straight out of the fridge can actually be more comfortable. Right, uh-huh. The other thing you can do is have it out of the fridge for a while and then ice pack his leg for a little bit just to chill his skin down and that way it won't, it'll reduce the zing sensation a bit. Um, but there is a difference between the powder versions and the liquid versions for those. Um, oh, it was, that's fine. It's, it's why we fought so hard when Humira was losing its market to get Amjavita brand and not some of the other brands because old Humira, and I don't see anyone who used to use old Humira on this call, but old Humira used to sting like no one's business. Mm. In fact, I think maybe there is someone here who used to, did, um, did Humira many years ago and that really stung, really, really stung. And then Humira took the citric acid out and preserved it by making it stronger. So it was kind of more like a, like a, and if you think about 
if you make jam, you make you reduce the water content, so it's it's thicker. So they did that, to that preserved it in its own right. So it didn't need to citric acid. When the new brands came to market, quite a few of them had citric acid in, and we didn't want to. Lots of adult sources wanted to use the citric ones because they were cheaper, and we fought very hard to have access to the non-citric containing ones so that we had a version that didn't sting like bilio. Um, mm -hmm. So we're very aware of that change. I'm sorry. John's finding it a bit more zingy. I hope he's okay with that. It's just some weeks, I don't know if it's everyone's the same. I think it was just a big change from it went from the nurse doing it for like six years to then we us doing it as a new injection. So I think at first they thought it was just me, but oh. the nurses did the same and it's been the same. Some weeks he's fine, then yeah. other weeks he'll sit and cry. But yeah. I think that's just the way it's going to be until he's not on them. I think that's just the way he's going to take it, to be honest. I think if he's he's finding that sort some cold packing to try, mm -hmm. if that doesn't work for a few weeks, give me a phone because there are other drugs that do the same idea as a tannis out there that we can have to think about. They all have slightly different preservative combinations in them, and there might be one we can try that might feel better for them because mm -hmm. I don't want them crying every week. That's not fair in him. You know. He's probably his voice. He's probably his own worst enemy because even I think if you mentioned another drug to him it will probably kick up again. Like, even if you mention yeah. methotrexate to him, yeah. it straight away say, no way, like, it's not happening because we didn't really have a good experience with it. But with this one, it seems to be doing its job. So yeah. I think you'd rather probably just stay on this one and take the pain for a couple of minutes. Yeah. There are also different brands of a tanner set out there. And we might be able to change a different brand and see if a different brand's better mm -hmm. from as well. It's worth a one-off trial it comes up and we just do a different brand and see if it's better for them as well so have a bash do some cold packing and see how it goes no thanks very much i'll try that one for no do it drew there's two um hands raised debbie i think you were first do you want to you're on mute at the minute so unmute yourself debbie and then um, just ask your way i uh, know I'm, I'm more apologizing for being late on this with we're all very new to this mm -hmm. um Dominic at the moment is, t we found out today that he's getting a central IV line fitted tomorrow. Okay. Um, I think we met you briefly, Drew, in Glasgow, along with Emma. Um, I'm sure, we, I'm, I think we met you. We've met so many different people just now, I've forgotten who we've met. Um, and he's getting put on immunoglobulin. Okay. To, I think that's that's yeah that's tomorrow. Okay. Like all these, it's just nice to hear everyone. All these medicines are all new to us. We're in very very early stages of a cystic arthritis, um, and it was just nice to join you. It's really, yeah. And we'll just want to, the IV, the central IV. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious of how that works and how that goes <laughs> uh do you mean in terms of putting it in or how, how does it work once we've got it once it's in i take it that they obviously have to re-pierce the skin because this is dominic's very big it's the needles mm -hmm. the needles the with the drips he's on weekly ivs and weekly bloods we wear daily bloods but it was the constant cannulas the needles so this is why we've gone on to getting a central IV line put in. Fair enough. And um, I take it he's going to theatre tomorrow for that then? Yeah, we're heading along yeah. to Edinburgh yeah. tomorrow morning. Um, yeah. So those lines, they come out sort of mid-chest, they go under the skin for quite a chunk, then go over his clavicle and down into his heart that way. Right. Um, you need to keep them nice and clean. Yeah. Um, it'll have a dressing on it. You're not going to change dressing for a week. But what it does is once it's in, when you come into your day unit, they clean the end of the cap. They might change the dressing for you, but they usually teach you to do that. They'll change, clean your cap, and that's it. There's no needles right. from that point onwards. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be a big help. Uh, we don't do it very often. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you were here earlier in the, in the chat just about sort of looking after young people's mental health and just that moment in time. We have done it because people just aren't coping, and we're, we're here to help, not make things worse. Yeah. And you a challenge it, it's not fair in him or you guys um central lines are great he can swim in them if it's if you double wrap it um they're good 
um, I'm going to tell you a funny story just, <laughs> just so I have told you. Um, I used to work in, I've done this job for about 10 years, the, the 10 years before I worked in a unit that did the rheumatology patients and renal patients. And one of my mums, when I was there, did phone to say, oh gosh, my daughter's lines just fallen out when she's playing in the garden. In a very, very panicked state. And it was like, just put your finger on it, it'll all be fine. Um, and it was all fine. And that happens. So brace yourself for those moments of absolute panic. Oh, There's stitch, but the stitch <laughs> won't last for, let's say the line's in for 20 years. The stitch only last for the first six months. And after that, it's held in just by the cuff because there's a bit of felt about sort of five centimeters under the skin there's a bit of felt that it forms a tight bond round but as you grow obviously it doesn't always hold so um yeah they're, mm. they're good <laughs> um, it makes life a bit easier for him which is yeah definitely good for him. Um, oh. any other any no other that was all really it was just nice like i say to join the meeting yeah. um and just Listen, I was aware I was delayed because I was on the phone to Edinburgh Sick Kids handing over to them yeah. and finding out tomorrow's plan. And Debbie, I guess it's very much one day at a time at the minute. You've got oh, a lot to take in. Yes, definitely. He's, we've had a lot of we've had a lot of problems with his ferritin levels. So Dominic's ferritin levels hit eleven thousand on Tuesday the first. Um and we're just, he seems to be stuck round about the 2000 level. Um, so we're, Dr Healy and Dr Walsh have obviously been chatting a lot and we're just trying to find new things and tweaking different medications to try and get everything back down and switched off. Yeah, hard. Yeah. Keep in touch on the snack parent group as well. I know yeah. you're just going there, Debbie, but and ask your questions away because that, that should be a good way to find from fellow parents and keep in touch with your rheumatology team. You are great. Um saying that on and say so you can't say how great you are, Drew, but I can. Yeah. Oh, but but uh, <laughs> through Nedma there's Imogen, um, mm -hmm. there's Gillian, there's the new lassie whose name I've just forgotten. <gasps> Well, there's a new nurse yes, I don't know her name yet. I can't yeah. remember. It'll come back to me in 10 minutes, but yeah, there's a lovely new nurse <laughs> I've spoken to a few times, so yeah. Yeah. Um, got one on the chat. Um, um, yeah. And it was, it's an older teen. We're not convinced that they are taking the methotrexate every week. Do you have any tips? <laughs> no names being mentioned, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the joy of teenagers mm. and... Yeah. <laughs> methotrexate. It, it, the big problem you have with methotrexate, one, it can make you feel not nice, two, it tends to be a poke or some tablets, but three, the, the bigger thing is that there's such a long time between taking it and it doing anything or mm -hmm. not taking it and it's stopping doing stuff, mm -hmm. and it's also so infrequent, and Probably. for lots of young people, that as I mentioned very briefly before, young people view time very differently from people in my age group. So a week to a young person is eternity. If you if you ask them how old are you, they'll say, oh, I'm nine and 17 weeks. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't, I'm 40 something now. I can't remember what number it is. It's my birthday in three weeks time. And I'm not even sure what number it is. It, it, so that that can be really difficult for, for young people to process an infrequent thing that takes months to work what we can do is just have longer chats with them in terms of just seeing where they're at. Sometimes what we have to do is actually allow them to say, I want to stop and try off and allow things to become not good again so that they feel the value of that methotrexate. Um, tips, try and make them be honest. Honesty is always the best policy. If they're going to do it in a different room, they're not doing it. Um, if they're telling you they've done it and there's no proof and you're asking, they've not done it. Um, many years ago, well, in fact, not even many years, I've got I have a whole host of teenagers who we've discovered through various routes are not taking their medicines. One of them had been injecting their teddy bear for, I think, 18 months with three different and, um, biologics. I think I worked out at the time it cost us 37,000 pounds 
we had changed drugs thinking, oh, this drug's not working, let's try a different one. And they had just never taken a single one. And they were a child of a very responsible set of parents in terms of you'd think, there's no way this isn't happening. If they say it's happening, it's happening. Like one, one of them was a consultant. Um, and the young, chi the young child was also really erudite, spoke, you know, butter wouldn't melt in their mouth. You would never have believed it. And they had a very crunchy teddy. So um, what, what is really um, the problem there is not that they didn't take it, is that they didn't come forward and tell us. Because actually we can manage that differently. There's some psychology, but even knowing they're not taking it makes our decisions better, but also means they start to be heard. Um, so no, no huge trips others and try and get some honesty. If they don't want to take it, tell us and let's chat about it and see what other options we can come up with. Because there's always another option out there that might suit them better. Um, I also yeah. feel money works well with teenagers. <laughs> the, the, on the subject of money, there was a lot of studies showing that if you want to use money, never promise it afterwards. Never, um, what you should do is you put £10 somewhere or however much money you said it's going to be out and you remove a bit of it every five minutes until they do something. And actually the removing of a pre of it is better than promising to build up and say, I'll give you a pound, I'll give you two pounds, is, is less effective than saying five pounds from the start. It's more effective to put the five pounds down and take money out of the pile as they go further and further away from the decision point. I'm not saying bribe your children, I'm really not. But <laughs> But if that's what you're doing, I recommend you do it this way. So, <laughs> yeah, but with my daughter, we have like a reward chart, and so she'll pick maybe something nice that she would like, and then she can build up her money. Yeah. To get to that. Yeah. The reward charts do work for all age groups, even even forty five years old. Well, the reward charts. So, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask another question? Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> Johnny's um, obviously he's twelve at the moment, but he's turning thirteen in June. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm just thinking about teenage life, just his age in general. Because that's him now at the teen rheumatology. Mm -hmm. I know probably not much of a difference, but I'm thinking about he's probably going to do a lot of growing in the next year, and I'm thinking hormones as well. Would that have a big impact on? Is arthritis or medication at all? Uh, so no, uh, getting bigger in terms of just weight and mass will maybe put his dose up. Um, Atarotip's not a drug we need to change the dose of too much too often because it, it comes in kind of quite set increments of what mm -hmm. you can get, quite a flexible dosing regime. Um, we tend not to have much problem with arthritis with if you're well controlled and doing your medicines. We do have lots of problems with the joy of hormones, the I'm not taking my meds this week, um, and that ended up being a disaster. Um, but the actual kind of just getting older, no. Um, just because you've brought up teenage things, what I didn't really mention in there was just drugs to think about in terms of becoming a mum or dad. Although I did mention it briefly, but if you're on things like methotrexate, MMF, azathioprine, they're real no-nos for becoming a mum or dad, particularly a mum chat to us about that moment we can change those drugs for something else um going back to your point um the teenage clinic before covid was actually really coming along lovely we've had arthritis versus arthritis in doing lots of one-to-one -one work with the young people about getting control of life not their arthritis in terms of like taking things off mum and dad in terms of i will sort out this i will sort out that and becoming just getting them used to the idea of being an adult and leaving home um, or being an adult and moving to adult services where and be, getting more independent in clinic all that's kind of on pause because of covid um, we're hoping to bring it back soon with some video conversing idea but that's proving a bit technical with trying to how to work it with clinic um, but no that's that should all be fine no that's fine thank you I've got another one. Um, Rosanna's just been changed on to, is it tocilizumab? Is that right? 
to sell a mad tuckless mad for everyone to see it it's <laughs> Um, she was on Humira beforehand, which was really good at controlling her uveitis. Is mm-hmm. Tocolizuma good for uveitis as well? Oh, so the all our drugs have this sort of mix in them in terms of our our older drugs had a much more genetic working pathway. So they tended to be more effective if they were the right drug. So methotrexate tends to work in 60, 70 of our kids. Our biologics, that sort of discussion we had earlier, just about 12 different functions, lots of different cells, the kind of route map of Scott Rail, bus routes and all over. GI and UVs annoyingly have a kind of zone card and can jump between the different pathways. And we're not always sure which pathway it's jumped around on. And with uveitis, our early successful drugs are methotrexate and um, MF. If they don't work, we're looking at our, our sort of like our TNFs tend to be the most effective ones. So your Humira, there's Golimabab as well. That's quite a good one. Infliximab is quite a good one. If one isn't working, you can always try the other one. If TNFs have failed for whatever reason, the other ones, the first one we tend to go to is tocolizumab. Um, those biologics in general tend to have this mix of 30% perfect, 40% all right, needs a bit of something else with its MF or MMF, and 30% it does just nothing. Tocolizumab for arthritis tends to be a more of a 50% works, 50% it does nothing kind of idea. The uveitis pile tends to be more of a bit of back in this pile of 30% works, 40% needs something else with it, 30% it doesn't do anything, but you don't know for a while. You just don't know for a while. Um, the other one sitting there is a bat acceptor, which is another common UVS. Many years ago, we used tons of rituximab for UVS. I think it was it was methotrexate that hasn't worked. So I worked. Let's use rituximab, and it's really fallen out of favour. Not because it doesn't work; it tends to work. But the problem with rituximab is you give it once, you give it two weeks later. And then you don't give it again until either you flare or we do a blood test to see what's happening. But if you miss time the blood test or we miss time with appointment, you're already in a nasty flare before we get around to giving it again. So your UVX does this, and that's what we don't want. So we've kind of moved away from it because it, it doesn't, it's really hard to keep it stable because if we overdose it, it's not good. And it's, it, it's a quite awkward, but it does work well if you can get it timed right. It's just timing it right. It's a, it's an absolute jiggle. So, you know, Douglas was a good, good drug. Um, I don't know what chat you've had from your local team. I do lots of chat about washing your feet and how to wash your feet. When we first started using Tocolizumab 12 years ago, we had so many infected toes. I can't tell you how many people infected toes. So the one thing I've learned over the years of using it is one, make sure she washes her feet. But the problem is that most people shower <laughs> and they start washing about mid thigh and don't ever get to their feet. So please wash their feet. Make sure you dry them and try and have two pairs of shoes for school. Not expensive, but just ones they wear Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and ones they wear Tuesday, Thursday. So that the pair have got a chance to dry. If you go and find anyone's shoes and take the insole out, the shoe underneath is soaking. And dampness and infection in toes are really bad. So make sure you take the insulate and dry that shoe just on the doorstep or on the radar, it doesn't matter. And get in the habit of trying to make sure she changes her socks when she comes in the door and changes her shoes when she comes in the door. So she's just got, she takes the dampness away and puts something dry on. And that, that bit of teaching I've done has cut the toenail infections down to almost nothing. But at the start, it was just, oh, it was just, it was pussy toes everywhere. So um, wash those feet. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Another um, one in the chat. Hold on. Um, side effects. My son started to get really itchy after taking methotrexate. Is that normal? Hmm. My first question would be how long are you itchy for afterwards? Um, not a common side effect can happen. I would probably want to chat to that person or get that person to chat to their local team just to make sure what's going on. You can 
if it's passing a little bit of itchiness, doesn't probably matter. If it's going on for longer than that, when I say passive, I mean like, you know, an hour that day, maybe the next morning, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's more than that, I'd want you to come and chat to us. Um, again, lots of our medicines, we have problems with the, not the medicine, but the stuff in the, in the bottle or in the injection or in the tablet. And sometimes switching brands, switching presentations or going from injection to tablet sorts it all out quite quickly. Um, so it's not a common thing to be itchy. I'd be interested for that person to get in contact. If it's a Glasgow Clyde family to get in contact with me directly, and we'll have a chat about that in more detail. If it's someone from further on to pops to their local team. Um, but just at the itchiness, my daughter oh, used to get quite itchy and it was um, a lot of the time it was dehydration. Uh -huh. But that's just on the other side. Um, right, we've got another one. Hold on, Preston, sorry. Was, was anybody else just going to respond to that, first of all? Sorry. I was going to check it as very minor side effects, but um, Evan's been getting like almost like spots, but in various parts of his body. And I contacted our local GP, and obviously it was a video kind of call where they took photographs just now. I'm always a little bit unsure of those those smaller side effects because the lists with the you know the side effects for methotrexate and oh. the other drugs are so extensive. Yeah. I never know when to make the judgment call that I should be contacting the rheumatology team or when I should just be going to my GP. And um, the GP looked at the photos and reassured me there was nothing to worry about. But I was a wee bit uncertain whether it, it should. So a wee bit like that kind of itching, those smaller side effects. I never really know when it's appropriate to contact rheumatology and when it's just the local GP. I think on the subject of sort of what you'd call minor, if you're worried about them, uh, I, I'm a big believer in using the, that gauge mum and dads have, a, have about when to worry. I think it's a very accurate thing of when to worry. And if it's little things that are annoying you, email us or at Next Clinic, discuss it. Don't worry about it. If it's getting to you, please phone us because even if it's something minor, it's nothing to do with methotrexate or whatever drug it happens to be, getting that out of your mind is very important. And rather than it nagging at you for weeks and months and you worrying about it, please give us a phone or an email and we'll have a chat about it. Probably do the same as GP and get you to send us some photographs. Skin rashes and spots in all young people are super common. I have seen so much acne since COVID started because of rugby masks. I cannot believe how much acne medication I've handed out. I think I'm almost a dermatology nurse now. Um, but please do speak to us because you not being worried is very important to us. Thank you. Um, Drew, I just had a very um, quick question about um, each time that we've had a break when we've kind of reached that two-year two mark where Catalina is quite stable and we've had maybe a break and gone back on, it's just flared and it's gone back onto medication or something, um, we seem to have this thing that the medication she was on previously then doesn't work. Is that a common thing or have we just been really unlucky? Um, it's a well-known thing that if you take a break from medicines, your arthritis or you guys will be grumpy on the way back and sometimes it can be harder to get control again. And that's a bit because the big difference between systemic arthritis and the other types of, of general arthritis is that one of them is more auto-inflammatory as opposed to autoimmune. And all the ones that are in the autoimmune side, so your uveitis is all your sort of oligo polys and stuff, because that's controlled by your adaptive immune system, they tend to come back with quite a, oh, I'm going to attack that, because they think it's measles, they think it's something else. So they can be quite hard to get in control of. It's also, people get bigger in the same time. So sometimes the dose of methotrexate we've got away with when you were smaller doesn't quite work when you're a bit older. And it's also on top of that, some of the anti-TNFs, if you come off them, it doesn't happen very often, your body can learn what that medicine is and treat it like it's an invader and want to fight it. So sometimes you try and restart that drug, the drug just doesn't work because your body's decided it doesn't like it anymore. So it, it okay. So there's there's four stories in there. One of them, one of them will be your experience. I don't know quite which one. Um, can we do, we, 
don't always know that there's some new tests for anti-TNFs to show if, they've, if you've built an antibody up to that, so we can figure that out. But sometimes just being bigger changes how the drug works, the doses we can get away with. If you think about things like um, Amgen, Vita, or Humira, they come in 20 or 40. And if you are a small person, you're on 20. But if you get bigger, you get to 40. But you may not be that you may be a small big person or a big big person and that number just doesn't equal the same inside your body um and that can be the tipping balance of getting under control or not so okay thank you and another very minor note to that is there's a, a professor mckinnis who he's a bit like um president obama he can talk the talk the talk of rheumatology but he's a, doing lots of research just now he's got a big research lab at, in Glasgow is the head of ULAR, which is the European um, Society of Rheumatology, and they're doing lots of projects now. And his big belief is your immune system changes throughout life and changes about when it's the drug that works at week one may not be the drug that will work in week 345, not because the drug changed, not because it's different, but actually your immune system is behaving differently because the, the cytokines are in a different point in the disease. Mm -hmm. And he's doing lots of work trying to figure out a way of can we pick out the change in immune system over lifetime and how we can work it better. Um, if you ever have the chance to hear him dial in, he is he's the Obama of, of speeches about rheumatology, is much better than me. <laughs> I was new to there and say maybe we'll invite him to a snack event, Drew, maybe oh, sometime. He he is he is the President Obama, he really is. He's, um, yeah. Sounds good. Has anybody else got any questions? Drew, we're so grateful for your time, but is there anything, don't, don't hang up without it. If you've got a question that you're thinking, I wish I'd asked, just ask now is the time, but otherwise we'll, we'll close. Um, I was going to ask, what do people think? Well, I just record it to the point of when I'm converting the recording into a film. Well, I just record it to the point of questions. Do you think that's better that we just record it and don't include people's questions or are people happy for their questions to be included? Maybe just respond on the chat so I can see it because you're all muted. But um, but if you're happy for, for your questions to be in the recording, let me just, just say happy to be included, happy for questions. But otherwise I can stop it after Drew's presentation. Or, or thumbs up is even better, well done. I would just like to say one last thing. You've all been very blessed. I fed the cat just before we started talking and he's not, he loves a video conference. He loves it and he's not been <laughs> annoying at all. I've been so impressed. So. <laughs> oh, well, my dog has been lying here beside me asleep, but it's been very helpful, Drew. And I think people who watch this another time will find it really helpful too. So thank you so much for your time. I'll just check a little more questions good. before we go. I think that's everyone saying the questions are fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, everyone have a lovely time and everyone have a lovely Christmas because it's coming and we're actually allowed to meet people again for five days. So it'll all be lovely. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Through some really useful stuff. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. No Thanks very much. And good luck tomorrow, you. Debbie. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much, Drew. Thank you. Bye. I'm just going to say bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.